1983 Murder Case, Cristina Lynn Castiglione In 1983, Cristina Castiglione's life came to a tragic end in Redford Township, a small community where she resided with her parents. At just 19 years old, Cristina was known for her kind-hearted nature, although she didn't seek the spotlight. With a cheerful disposition and a friendly demeanor, she had a knack for brightening up the lives of those around her. While not yet married, she was in a committed relationship with a steady boyfriend. Christina had found herself a job as a clerk in the research department at the Detroit Edison Company, but there was something stirring in her restless soul. She had recently reached out to an army recruiter to start a new chapter in her life. It was on that fateful evening of March 19, 1983, that she was last seen strolling along Five Mile Road near Lola Park. Days turned into an agonizing wait as her worried mother reported her missing to the authorities on March 21st. The grim discovery came eight days later when the Livingston County Sheriff's Office uncovered Christina's lifeless body in the secluded expanse of Oak Grove State Game Area. The snowy terrain bore witness to a heinous crime, revealing her partially clothed form, a victim of both strangulation and sexual assault. As the investigation unfolded, it became evident that her body had been abandoned prior to the snowfall, mere moments after her presence was last acknowledged in Redford. The dedication of law enforcement in those early days to preserve vital evidence proved instrumental as male DNA was extracted during the autopsy, serving as a lasting trace of her assailant. By the Michigan State Police Crime Lab in the early 2000s, the identity of the perpetrator remained elusive, shrouding Christina Castiglione's case in a veil of unanswered questions and haunting mystery. Decades after the chilling murder of Christina Castiglione, a glimmer of hope emerged in the form of advanced DNA testing. In March 2022, the Sheriff's Office, driven by an unwavering commitment to justice, secured grant funding through Season of Justice to unlock the secrets held within the preserved DNA samples collected back in 1983. In May 2022, Othram, a renowned forensic laboratory armed with groundbreaking technology, also helped a great deal. With their expertise in forensic-grade genome sequencing, Othram's scientists skillfully deciphered a comprehensive genealogical profile from the mysterious male DNA. Their findings became the pivotal leads that breathed new life into the Castiglione murder investigation. In February 2023, the Livingston County Cold Case Team followed these leads, ultimately shining a spotlight on a suspect named Charles David Shaw. At the time of the heinous crime, Shaw was a 26-year-old man whose involvement in the case was confirmed through three separate familial DNA comparison tests. However, justice would forever remain elusive, as Shaw's death in November of 1983 meant he would never face accountability in a court of law. In a cruel twist of fate, the medical examiner's report classified his death as accidental sexual asphyxiation, leaving the wounds of the past only partially healed, with unanswered questions lingering in the air. While no direct links between Christina and Shaw were uncovered, it was discovered that he had been a longtime resident of Livonia, residing within a mere five-mile radius of the place where Christina had vanished. The revelation of Charles David Shaw's involvement in the Christina Castiglione case was bone-chilling for his own family. Shaw's brother, taken aback by the news, confessed that he had been oblivious to his brother's dark secrets. Being slightly older, he was serving in the military during the tumultuous period of Charles's life, rendering him unable to witness firsthand the unfolding tragedy. The sheriff's office, in their pursuit of truth, gathered insights from Shaw's family which painted a distressing picture of a troubled individual. It was revealed that Shaw grappled with the demons of mental illness, struggled with his gender identity, and battled a compulsive sexual addiction. The disturbing fragments of his life were slowly falling into place. Livonia Police Department records revealed a series of arrests spanning over the course of a decade. In 1973, Shaw was apprehended on a breaking and entering charge, followed by a drug possession arrest in 1977. The year 1981 marked a turning point as he faced sentencing, serving two weeks in jail and probation for an attempted abduction in Fowlerville. The disturbing trend continued in 1982 when he was arrested for the larceny of women's shoes from a local Kmart. Yet despite these glimpses into Shaw's troubled past, 
detectives were still unable to establish any direct connection between him and Cristina Castiglione, leaving the motive for her targeting shrouded in uncertainty. In the arduous quest for justice, the cooperation of the Shaw family proved instrumental in uncovering the truth behind Cristina's murder. Their willingness to assist law enforcement throughout the investigation played a vital role in identifying Charles Shaw as the perpetrator. Regarding Charles Shaw's gender identity issues, the sheriff expressed hesitancy in providing a definitive comment due to being unfamiliar with the specific interviews and terminologies used by Shaw's family. He acknowledged that gender dysmorphia can sometimes contribute to homicidal behavior, but emphasized the challenges faced by individuals dealing with gender identity issues in the early 80s. The social climate and societal pressures of that time, particularly in the Livonia-Redford area, could have been significant stressors. A release from the sheriff's office emphasized the importance of closure not only for Christina's surviving family members, but also for other victims and their families who have long awaited justice for decades. With genealogical DNA technology continuing to aid law enforcement in their pursuit of justice, there is hope that not only the surviving members of Christina's family, but also other victims and their families who have endured decades of unanswered questions will find closure. Barbara Brodkin On March 19, 1993, the world shattered for Barbara Brodkin and her young son, Zachary. It was a day that would forever haunt their memories. Zachary, only six years old at the time, discovered his mother's lifeless body sprawled out on the floor of her Balliol Street apartment in Toronto. The scene was gruesome, and the tragedy of her death was amplified by the brutality of the crime. Barbara had been stabbed in the chest, and signs of strangulation suggested a chilling act of violence. The investigation into Barbara Brodkin's murder had initially focused on her ex-husband, Christopher Barry the prime suspect identified by the Toronto Police Homicide Squad. Living nearby and having both motive and opportunity, he seemed like the most likely perpetrator. However, after an exhaustive investigation that involved interviewing 295 witnesses and confirming his girlfriend's alibi, the ex-husband was eventually cleared of suspicion. With an alibi and providing hair and saliva samples, Barry evaded the clutches of justice. He then passed away in 2009, leaving the case cold and unsolved. But fate has its way of intervening when we least expect it. In 2017, a breakthrough emerged as the forensic scientists at the Center for Forensic Science resubmitted Barbara's clipped fingernails for DNA analysis. And there it was, a tiny but significant clue hidden beneath her nails. A DNA sample that didn't belong to her or any of the previous suspects. This new evidence pointed to a man named Charles Mustard, whose DNA was found exclusively under Barbara's fingernails. The long arm of the law finally reached out and grabbed Mustard on October 19, 2018, charging him with the murder of Barbara Brodkin. A day before Mustard's apprehension, the police orchestrated a mock news conference reigniting public interest in the cold case. Meanwhile, investigators summoned Mustard to 40 College Street luring him under the pretense of signing some paperwork. The trap was set, and justice was about to be served. In the judge alone trial in February 2023, the courtroom brimmed with anticipation as the evidence against Mustard unfolded before the eyes of the justice system. As the trial unfolded, Mustard took the stand in his own defense, weaving a web of uncertain memories and questionable explanations. He admitted to seeing posters with photographs of women, but initially claimed no recognition of Barbara Brodkin, only noting a vague sense of familiarity. Under cross-examination, however, Mustard changed his tune, acknowledging that he did recognize Barbara in those photographs, but insisted he had not known it was her at the time. This led the judge to characterize his response as a blatant and obvious lie, motivated by his desire to distance himself from Barbara. Denying any involvement in her murder, Mustard testified that he had not seen Barbara for several days, with the last encounter being a transaction where she sold him marijuana. Mustard had also claimed to not only be a customer, but also a friend of Barbara's. The missing little cosmetic suitcase, which was known to contain both marijuana and cash, became a significant point of interest for the prosecution, suggesting a possible motive for the crime, robbery. Brodkin's lifeless body was discovered in her bedroom closet in close proximity to where she kept her stash and money. 
Mustard claimed that the DNA found under Brodkin's fingernails was the result of their shared joint smoking session, where he would lick the marijuana cigarette with his saliva before smoking it, possibly transferring his DNA unknowingly. However, the court also learned about Mustard's troubled past, including an extensive criminal record for theft and sexual assault. In 1992, he had been charged criminally and subsequently dismissed from his teaching position, contradicting his earlier claims of financial stability. The defense's attempt to cast suspicion on Brodkin's ex-husband as the true culprit was dismissed by the judge, who cited the ex-husband's history of domestic violence, assault charges, and ongoing custody battle with Brodkin over their young son. When the judge delivered the decision in court on April 5, 2023, Mustard, who was 37 at the time of Brodkin's death, appeared stunned and disoriented. Charles Mustard, sentenced to life with no chance of parole, will likely spend the rest of his life behind bars for the murder of Barbara Brodkin. Bob Richardson, a seasoned defense lawyer, stood by with co-counsel Amanda Warth, expressing their disappointment with the verdict. While they refrained from further comments, they hinted at the possibility of an appeal, indicating their intention to explore all available legal avenues. In her compelling closing arguments, Prosecutor Karen Simone highlighted the significance of Mustard's DNA evidence, painting a picture as if Barbara Brodkin, even from beyond the grave, was pointing directly at her killer. While the judge acknowledged the Crown's argument that Mustard should be held accountable for the first-degree murder of Barbara Brodkin due to the confinement in her bedroom closet during the attack, ultimately, the judge did not accept this proposition. However, second-degree murder still carried a mandatory sentence of life imprisonment, leaving the judge with the task of determining the length of time Mustard must wait before being eligible to apply for parole. However, during the trial, the judge questioned why Mustard pretended not to recognize her photographs when they were displayed on posters at Toronto Police Headquarters in 2018. The judge determined that Brodkin's defensive wounds, evidenced by scratches inflicted by her desperate attempts to protect herself during the prolonged assault, were crucial in proving Mustard's involvement. The transfer of DNA under her nails was not a casual occurrence, such as sharing a moistened cigarette, as argued by the defense. In conclusion, the prosecutor emphasized the incongruity of Brodkin using both hands if she had indeed smoked a joint with mustard, challenging his version of the events. As the case neared its end, the evidence painted a grim picture, leaving the judge to weigh the gravity of mustard's actions and determine an appropriate sentence, while Brodkin's memory lingered forever etched in the hearts of her family and those who sought justice on her behalf. Opalika Jane Doe, The Case of Amor Jovea Wiggins On January 28, 2012, Opalika police received a distressing call, leading them to Brookhaven Trailer Park on Hearst Street in Opalika, Alabama. The reason for their visit was the discovery of skeletal remains. While investigating the area, they found a skull in the yard of a residence, and just a few feet away, hidden in the bushes behind a trailer and the adjacent lot, they unearthed the majority of the bones. During their search, they also came across a poignant find, a pink child's shirt and a small bundle of curly hair. These remains were carefully sent to the FBI laboratory in Quantico, Virginia, where a thorough medical examination took place. The subsequent report revealed that the remains belonged to a black female estimated to be between four and seven years old. She became known as Baby Jane Doe by the community. Tragically, an autopsy revealed the existence of more than 15 individual fractures scattered across her skull, arms, legs, shoulders, and ribs, all indicating blunt force trauma. The fractures showed signs of healing, suggesting that these injuries had occurred prior to her death. Additionally, the medical examiner suspected that Jane Doe may have suffered from malnourishment and blindness in her left eye, likely caused by a fracture in her eye socket. The conclusion was heart-wrenching. Jane Doe's death was a result of homicide, believed to have taken place between the summer of 2010 and 2011. Since the discovery of her remains, detectives have devoted countless hours reviewing over 15,000 case files from the Alabama Department of Public Health and following up on thousands of tips, hoping to bring justice to baby Jane Doe. In 2016, a significant lead emerged in the investigation of Opalika Jane Doe's identity. Investigators received a tip 
suggesting that she may have attended Vacation Bible School at Greater Peace Church in 2011, a mere three miles away from where her remains were discovered. To aid in the search for her identity, photographs from the Bible School were released to the public, with investigators strongly believing that the unidentified child in those pictures was indeed Opalika Jane Doe. In hopes of generating recognition, an artist rendering of what she might have looked like was also made public. Despite pursuing numerous leads and tips, the mystery surrounding Opalika Jane Doe persisted. However, with advancements in DNA testing, a breakthrough occurred in January of 2022. DNA was further extracted, specifically from the scalp by Othram Labs and from the hair by Astria Labs, aiming to obtain DNA suitable for genealogy testing. Through the combined efforts of these laboratories, a comprehensive genealogical profile was constructed from Othram's DNA extract, which was subsequently uploaded to a DNA database. Upon the profile's upload, a skilled genealogist, affiliated with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, Dr. Barbara Ray Venter from Firebird Forensics Group, was assigned to the case. Using the genealogical profile, Dr. Ray Venter diligently traced potential relatives and developed investigative leads inching closer to unraveling the mystery surrounding Opalika Jane Doe's identity. In a significant development in October of 2022, the father of Jane Doe was finally identified as 50-year-old Lamar Vickerstaff Jr. Born and raised in Opalika, Alabama, Mr. Vickerstaff had enlisted in the U.S. Navy and embarked on a lengthy career that took him to various locations, including Norfolk, Virginia, Honolulu, Hawaii, and Jacksonville, Florida. Upon the discovery of his daughter's fate, Opalika detectives made the journey to Naval Base Mayport in Jacksonville, where Mr. Vickerstaff was currently stationed to deliver the heart-wrenching news of his daughter's death. During the meeting with Mr. Vickerstaff, investigators were unable to extract any information from him regarding the identity of Jane Doe. Subsequently, detectives proceeded to meet with Mr. Vickerstaff's wife, Ruth Vickerstaff, who had been married to Lamar since May of 2006. Mrs. Vickerstaff, however, informed the detectives that she had no knowledge of his daughter and was unaware of the identity of Jane Doe's mother. Dr. Ray Venter, however, managed to identify several potential matches for Jane Doe's mother. The diligent efforts of the detectives helped narrow down the results, ultimately leading them to a woman residing in Maryland. In December of 2022, the detectives met with 37-year-old Sherry Wiggins, who confirmed her status as the biological mother of Jane Doe, or rather, a more Jovea Wiggins. Ms. Wiggins, a Norfolk, Virginia native, revealed that she had given birth to a Moor in January of 2006. She provided documentation proving that Lamar and Ruth Vickerstaff had legally and physically obtained custody of her daughter in 2009, subsequently suspending her visitation rights. She also provided compelling evidence of continuous child support payments made to Lamar Vickerstaff since 2009. Opalika detectives reached out to school boards and pediatric clinics in various states where Lamar and Ruth Vickerstaff had resided. Their extensive inquiries revealed that Amor had never been enrolled in school and had never been reported missing. Armed with this vital information, the Opalika detectives convened a meeting with the Lee County District Attorney's Office to determine the appropriate charges relating to the tragic death of Amor Wiggins. On January 17, 2023, Lamar and Ruth Vickerstaff were apprehended in Jacksonville, Florida. Lamar Vickerstaff faced charges of felony murder and failure to report a missing child, while his wife, Ruth Vickerstaff, was charged with the latter offense. Following their arrest, they were held at the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office until the extradition process could take them to Lee County, Alabama. Moving forward, a preliminary hearing took place on March 22, 2023, shedding light on the cases of Lamar and Ruth Vickerstaff. During the hearing, Detective Alfred White revealed crucial details regarding the interviews conducted with the Vickerstaffs by the police. Detective White disclosed that Ruth Vickerstaff had confessed to being untruthful during her initial arrest, claiming that she had been unaware of the gravity of the situation. According to her statement, while she and Lamar had custody of Amor Wiggins, the responsibilities became overwhelming, leading her to request Lamar to take Amor to his family. She alleged that this was the last time she saw Amor. Detective White further shared that someone acquainted with Ruth had reported prior knowledge of Amor's injuries prior to her tragic demise. 
During Lamar Vickerstaff's police interview, Detective White revealed that Lamar had confessed to the murder of Amor Wiggins. However, he vehemently denied being responsible for the observed injuries found on her remains and captured on church surveillance footage. Lamar claimed that he had made efforts to bring Amor back to life following the murder. He also expressed a request to the police that Ruth not be charged in connection with Amor's death. Following the preliminary hearing, Lamar Vickerstaff was denied bail, indicating that he would remain in custody until the conclusion of his trial. On the other hand, Ruth Vickerstaff was granted bail but required to wear an ankle monitor while awaiting trial in Jacksonville. If convicted, Lamar Vickerstaff could face either a sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole or the death penalty, depending on the outcome of the trial. In contrast, Ruth Vickerstaff could potentially be sentenced up to 10 years in prison, if found guilty. These legal ramifications highlight the severity of the charges faced by the Vickerstaffs and underscore the importance of the upcoming trial in determining their ultimate fate and the justice to be served for the tragic loss of Amore Wiggins. <laughs>